He's strong of mind, strong of soul, and strong of body. An admirable quality, at other times. The truth will be known. I've never failed to make it so. Ronin wasn't entirely sure where he was, or what was happening. Felt like he was floating, between sleep and waking. Felt bloody weird. No more. He's been through enough. Return him to me. <laughs> You're resilient, Ronin Wizard. You surprised one who's usually little surprised. More to the point, you held your secrets. However foolish that may be. There's nothing I can tell you. That remains to be seen. We will know what happened to your companion. And why you, who should not be here, are. But for now, you should rest. That much you deserve. Cenarius then waved a hand over Ronin's face. And the wizard passed out. Meanwhile, Gracis also had no idea where he was. Twas a cavern, but one he did not recognise at all, thanks to his absolute bonk memory. But what bothered him the most was that he could not sense the presence of any other creature here, not even one of his own kind. Gracis then looked around and realised there was no visible exit to this place. Balls. I do not have time for these games. I do not have time for these games. I do not have time for these games. Gracis then sighed in frustration before collecting his thoughts. He was obviously missing something. Surely he'd been brought to this place for a reason, but what? And then, a smile formed on the Dragon Mage's face, as he recalled a certain ritual that his own kind used on occasion. So, the mage turned in a circle three times, whilst reciting a ritual greeting in a language older than the world itself, emphasising the correct parts of the sentence, as only one who had learned it from the very source of that language could. Speaks the tongue of those who brought us into being. It must be one of us then, for it surely cannot be one of them. All must be known. Suddenly, as if by magic, several red dragons appeared, staring at Krasis as if he was some small but tasty morsel of food. But Krasis just stood there and stared back. Definitely one of us. That's why I brought him. That and his incessant whining. If you had the sense the creators gave you, you would have known me for what I am and the urgency of my message immediately. See? Incessant whining. <sighs> Where are we? If you truly are one of us, little dragon, then you should know this place as well as you know your nest. Krasis cursed his addled memory under his breath, but then used his brain to try and figure it out anyway. Is it... the home caverns? The realm of beloved Alexstrasza? You did want to come here. The question remains, does he go any further? He goes as far as he desires, if he can answer me a simple question. Another male dragon then approached, this one significantly larger than the others. If you are one of us, you must know who I am. Again, the mage struggled with his tattered memories and concentrated really hard. Tyrannistras. Tyran, the scholarly one. Consort to Alexstrasza. You are indeed one of us then, although I cannot place you. I've been given a name for you by the one who brought you, but clearly it's wrong. Among us, a name is given to one and only one. There is no mistake, and I can explain why. The explanation you've given has been relayed to us, and it's found too astonishing to be true. What you say falls into the realm of the Timeless One, Nosdormu, but even he would not be as careless as to do as you have shown. He's adult, plain and simple, perhaps, but he did answer my question. You are of the flight, and therefore have the right to enter this lair. Come, I'll take you to the one who will settle this matter for us all. The one who knows all her flight. She'll recognize you, and therefore recognize the truth. You'll take me to Alexstrasza. None other. Come on. So, Tyranna has... Tyranna has? Tyran... Tyrannostras went ahead and did just that, leading Krasis through a bunch of tunnels that weren't there a second ago, until finally... With your permission, my love. Always for you. Krasis felt a twinge of jealousy for a moment, before getting over it. The Queen of Life was jam-packed full of love. Plenty of it, to go around. My Queen. Alexstrasza somewhat acknowledged Krasis, before returning her gaze back to Tehran. Would you leave us alone, for a time? So, wordlessly, the big old behemoth backed out of the chamber, and then there was awkward silence. 
Crasis waited for some sign of recognition, but received none. My queen, can it be that you of all beings do not know me? Again, Alexstrasza studied him. I know what I sense, and I know what I feel. And because of that, I have taken the story you have told the others under serious consideration. I have already decided what must be done. But first, there is another who must be involved in this situation. One whose august opinion is as dear to me as my own. From a nearby passage, yet another male dragon emerged, moving slowly as if each step was a heavy labour. But it wasn't that the dragon was old. They appeared to be afflicted by some unknown malady. You summoned me, my Alexstrasza. I asked for your presence here, yes. Forgive me if the effort strains you too much. There is nothing I would not do for you, my love. The Dragon Queen then gestured towards the mage, who now looked as if he'd been struck by lightning. This is... what do you call yourself? Cor... Krasis, my queen. Krasis? <laughs> there was a hint of amusement in Alexstrasza's voice. And this, Krasis, is one of my most beloved subjects. My most recent consort, one whom I already greatly look for guidance. Being one of us, you may have heard of him before. His name is Corielstras. Meanwhile again, Malfurion and Brox arrived at their destination, with a tense silence hanging in the air. We're here. In a few moments, the oak should be in sight. However, despite being near his goal, Malfurion felt bloody awful. His life had forever changed. If the Moon Guard found out about this, he'd be shunned. Literally. No Night Elf, not even Tyrande or Illidan, would ever be allowed to interact with him ever again. And on top of that, Malfurion felt guilt for leaving the Hunters to face that demonic creature. Just as he said though, an oak tree then suddenly appeared ahead of them. Brox, I must ask a favour of you. I owe you much. Ask it. Go to that tree. Touch the palm of your hand to the trunk. So, slightly confused, Brox walked over to the tree and did what he was told. What do I do now? Nothing. Simply stand there. It's learning of you. Your hand will tingle, but that's all. What Malfurion did not mention was that tingling sensation was actually the result of tiny root tendrils now penetrating the orc's flesh. The oak was learning of Brox by briefly becoming a part of him. But Brox stood there, his eyes fixed on his palm, patiently waiting until finally, it's done. The way is open to us now. Malfurion then led the orc forward, past the oak, and into a serene glade. However, both of them looked ever so slightly surprised at the figure, just kind of sitting around in the middle of it. You shouldn't be here. I come with him, wizard, and need no permission of yours. Ronin then stood up and shook his head at the misunderstanding. No, I mean this isn't your time. You shouldn't exist here at all. Ronin then raised a hand, which Malfurion didn't like, looked like some kind of threat. So, the druid prepared a spell of his own. There will be none of that in my sanctum. And then, Cenarius arrived. Of you, young night elf, I expect better. But these are strange times. Cenarius then eyed Brox. I'm growing stranger with each passing hour, it seems. Brox growled, defiantly, but Malfurion went ahead and nudged him. This is the Lord of the Forest. The demigod Cenarius, the one to whom I said I would bring you, Brox. And that one? Is he another demigod? He's part of a puzzle. You look to be another piece of the same one. You recognize this newcomer, friend Ronin? The wizard remained silent, causing Cenarius to shake his head in disappointment. I mean you no harm, Ronin. But too much has come about that I and the others find disturbing. You, your companion, and now this one. His name is Brox. This one named Brox. Another being the likes of which I have never seen. How does Brox come to be here, my student? I suspect there's a tale to tell. And so, Alfurion went ahead and regaled the story of the last several chapters. However, in his version, all blame lay at his feet. He barely mentioned Illidan and Tyrande at all. But, Cenarius saw right through that anyway. I said that the destinies of your brother and you would take different roads. I believe that fork has now come, whether you know it or not. I do not understand. It's a talk for another time. Time we do not have at the moment. 
Cenarius was now staring into the forest, slightly distracted. You'd better prepare yourselves. You included, friend Ronin. Me? What is it, Shando? We're about to be attacked, and I fear that even I may not be able to protect all of you. 